Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our session In Conversation with Michael Casson, Content and Platforms. Please welcome Chairman and CEO of MediaLink, Michael Casson. Thank you. I, I, I think it's actually going to be more a conversation by, and hopefully after I have a few remarks we can get into conversation with. But um, thank you for spending the time on a beautiful day here in Miami when you could be sitting out in the sun or uh, doing something uh, more productive. But hopefully we can keep you interested for a little while. The track of this 2013 NAPI agenda is called Game Changers. If we want to stay true to this year's theme of Beyond Disruption, I have another suggestion. Instead, why don't we call it the changing game? Because that's the crux of the issue. It's not as much about who's changing the game as it is about how the game itself is changing. The increase in data speeds, the falling cost of software development and hardware manufacturing, the rise of the cloud, which we'll talk about later, the proliferation of devices, a revolution in pricing. Innovation is distributed, innovation is democratized. In a way, it's like a board game. That's an analog analogy, if you will. There's one board game that's popular with the kids these days. These days, It's called The Settlers of Catan. It was created by a dental technician named Klaus Tuber, who invented the game in his spare time as a way to entertain his wife and children. With adoption by the world's technorati, it has sold over 30 million copies worldwide. To put that success in context, Halo 3, the mega hit game, has sold just under 12 million copies worldwide. What's special about Settlers of Catan and what makes it relevant to our discussion today is that the board changes in every game. You don't fall down the same chutes or climb up the same ladders. In Settlers of Catan, the environment itself is ever changing, and so players must constantly assess and reassess their strategies. You could say it's as much about the board as it is the player. Similarly, in today's digital ecosystem, you won't necessarily succeed by changing the game because the game is constantly changing around you. How do you win at that? Part of it is recognizing that this is not a zero-sum game. Unlike most board games, where a dollar won generally means a dollar, another dollar lost, in the video ecosystem, as in Settlers, the pie expands and contracts based on gameplay. You win by anticipating where the game is going to be. Skate to where the puck is, as we say. The game is also dynamic. While you take your turn in Monopoly, I sit on my hands and wait. But in Settlers, every roll of the dice can change the whole balance of the board. Every turn engages every player. And did I mention that the game is lightning quick? Speed is key, and before you know it, you're playing in an entirely new environment. That's a whole new kind of fast. Perhaps the most perplexing part of all this is that those sudden changes include a flood of new players. The media and marketing industry's value chain is under a sustained and intensifying assault of new ideas, new solutions, and changing opportunities that go way beyond a buzzword like disruption. At CES a few weeks ago, I had the pleasure of interviewing Mark Benioff, the founder, chairman, CEO of Salesforce, on a keynote session, Marketing in the Cloud. He opened with a point that resonated with me. To to, that resonated with me. To paraphrase Mark, he said, the world is both transforming and is transformed. The technologies we use have now scaled, and old, and old adjectives are becoming obsolete. What phone isn't smart? What screen isn't flat? One, what internet connection isn't high speed? If you're from LA as I am, you are undoubtedly familiar with that mantra that we use. Instant gratification isn't quick enough. Let's take a look at the transformed and the transforming along the video chain. Our first task is to locate the pressure points where disruption is inciting fundamental change. As we shimmy up and down that chain, we're going to start with development and production. Then we'll look at aggregation and distribution. And finally, of course, consumption. How the end user is being affected by or sometimes affecting all of this disruption. From there, we'll pinpoint some bottlenecks on the chain and suggest a number of innovations and opportunities that can drive success in the complex, challenging, and ever-changing game we're all playing. By that time, we'll hopefully have passed go and collected our $200. 
At its core, content creation is about understanding the effects of supply and demand. The costs of production, as we know, are falling incredibly fast. The number of outlets for distribution are increasing just as quickly. More high quality content is being created than ever before and by more creators. With audiences at scale across platforms, studios that lack or avoid traditional distribution mediums have produced blockbuster content. In May, Machinima CEO Alan Debevoir, who I think you'll hear from later today, announced Forward Onto Dawn, an original Halo miniseries in collaboration with Microsoft. Debevoir actually used the phrase tipping point in that introduction, and the numbers back him up. Episode number one of the miniseries drew more than 10 million views. That's the same number of viewers that watched Kim Kardashian's first wedding, I say first because who knows, in 2011. And by comparison, the show actually lasted longer than the marriage. More importantly, viewers of the Halo series were significantly more likely to pre-order Halo 4. Here's another marker on the field of change. YouTube star Jenna Marbles has nearly 6 million subscribers and almost 1 billion views. PBS was thrilled when Downton Abbey's season three premiere drew 8 million viewers. Happy to say I was one of them a few months ago. Jenna Marbles, Jenna, Jenna say that fast, Michael. Jenna Marbles put out a video called Things, Girl Lie, Things Girls Lie About. That ratcheted up nearly 13 million views. And which do you think costs less to produce? Which is not to say that high quality programming is doomed. There are still real dollars being invested in original programming online. Netflix, a commonly cited example, has invested hundreds of millions of dollars in original content. House of Cards premiering very soon, actually I believe this week in a special premiere, a new Netflix series starring Kevin Spacey, and this year, Arrested Development finally returns to the air. At $8 a month, Netflix is starting to look awfully like a feature-laden HBO, with top-notch original programming, a massive library of movies, and aggregated television programming. Oh, and by the way, they've changed the economics of documentary filmmaking as well, breathing new life into what many thought was a moorbound genre. YouTube, utilizing its massive global reach, global distribution reach, has become an active source of funds for original content creation. As many of you know, we spent some time last year at the outset, at the launch here with Alex Carlos, who was up on the stage just a moment ago, talking about it. As we look back over the year, I think a lot of lessons will be learned. But in, in point of fact, YouTube has committed $350 million in some form or another to original production, as well as digital P&A, funding hundreds of channels and enabling millions of content creators. Consumers spend nearly 400% more time streaming online video than watching DVD, Blu-ray, and four times more than downloading premium content from iTunes. Non-traditional production is already booming and only growing in market share. As we move deeper into the digital age, the first digital natives have already turned 30. The experience of consuming video is moving to one of ubiquity, not one of scarcity. And there's a whole host of new players out there eager to scratch that itch. Even Monopoly is adding a new token to the game this year. I confess I was a little surprised when I heard their big idea was a robot. Then again, I guess an iPad would make, wouldn't make for a very good token, even a small one. Let's talk about how content travels. Once again, disruption is transforming the value chains, aggregation, and distribution methods. You may have heard, read, or seen media stories that qualify the cord-cutting phenomenon as nowhere near a critical mass. They said that about smartphones once as well. The truth is, cord-cutting, new technology, and over-the-top solutions are challenging traditional media, traditional media models. They're challenging everybody, actually. I've seen estimates that the number of messages sent via OTT will exceed SMS messaging by the end of this year. Not that the familiar players aren't responding. Cable companies are developing offers to attract and retain customers, but of the 1.8 million household, new households created in 2011, only 17% of those signed up for cable TV. 20% of pay TV customers under the age of 44 have considered cutting the cord, and 31% of customers aged 18 to 24 have already shaved their cable services. Last year, 
a designer launched Take My Money HBO, an online survey asking the premium channel to decouple itself from cable providers and offer HBO Go as a standalone service. Well over 160,000 people responded within the first two days. On average, users said they'd pay around $12 monthly for an HBO subscription. HBO, for what it's worth, said no thanks. But while traditional creators and providers dither, new players are emerging. The startup, Boxy, is manufacturing set-top boxes that marry the app experience with live television. It costs $99, a one-time fee, compared with that much every month for cable. And it's being sold exclusively now at more than 3,000 Walmart locations. Aereo, and I think you will hear or have heard from Chet Kenosha this morning, is another player to watch. With their tiny antenna, Aereo turns your iPhone or iPad into a live TV. They've been encumbered with some legal challenges, but so far uh, the, the die is not cast, and I think they have a real opportunity to be game changers. We could rattle off a hundred potential game changers. Maybe it's the guy with the biggest antenna. But the trick is to take a step back and see how the game itself is changing. Channels strong and weak, good and bad, compelling and confounding, used to be bundled into a single package. But as consumers, you know now we have a choice. The all-you-can-eat buffet days are over, and viewers are accustomed now to ordering exactly what they want when they want it. The best, best distribution strategies will preserve choice, not, not force costs. And that brings us finally to the reason for all this, consumers. Think about music for a moment. Before Steve Jobs came around, the music industry thought their customer was Tower Records. That's who was buying the music from them after all. Steve Jobs recognized that his customers were the consumers, not the retailers. And with that realization, he created an integrated value chain that clearly turned an industry and a world arguably upside down. When it comes to video, what the consumer wants is a ubiquitous platform, content delivered anywhere at any time on any device. As you well know, younger viewers are already conditioned to having it their way. 40% of TV viewers aged 18 to 24 no longer watch TV at its appointed time because of the ability to time shift or catch up via online viewing. Stacking and binging are the two words that we all need to know and know well. It's the way content is being enjoyed more and more and more by every generation. All one need do is get on an airplane these days and watch what people are watching on their, on their iPads or on their desktops and you'll see what we're talking about. Streaming and downloaded internet video together already comprise nearly 14% of all video consumed. The idea of watching a movie or a TV show on a video gaming system is so familiar, it's almost old school by now. Remember, as I said, the oldest digital natives are already 30. This is their normal. More and more, we want to consume video content as a part of an ecosystem. Whether that's with a tablet as a second screen, or with tweets playing alongside programming, or even baked into more traditional devices. Samsung, for instance, has become a leader in smart television sets. Its new interface is made up of five pages, and only one of those five is for live TV. Social networking, music, photos, and apps are all part of an immersive experience of which video is just one. And if you saw the article in this weekend's, I believe it, Weekend Wall Street Journal talking about Samsung and the assault on Apple, I think all one need to do is watch those two companies and see who's going to win the fight. Globally, I think as much as we all could find ourselves prisoners in an iOS walled garden, I think if you look at the lay of the land 18 months from now, you'll see a different picture. I think the numbers will lead you to a different conclusion. Consumption no longer means gathering the family in front of television sets on Sunday nights. We know that. It can be that, but it must also be available on demand on the subway Monday morning or during your lunch break on Wednesday. Posting your reaction on Facebook is just as important and must, and must be just as available as what they say the next day on the water cooler, at the water cooler, or maybe on the water cooler. I don't know. I say all this with the suspicion that an Apple ITV is on the horizon. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, if consumers want all this, and we aren't provide, then why aren't we providing it? 
The fact is, there are bottlenecks in the value chain that are preventing the game from being played successfully. Two big ones, in fact, cost and discovery. The first snag is cost. Buyers, as I've said, have been forced to cough up for overbundled TV packages for a long time. That era is ending. We need to think in a more granular fashion. It's less about providers, studios, or even channels. It's more about apps, shows, and stars. Viewers have realigned their expectations to where the talent is, where the action is, where the funny is. That's why people like Louis C.K., Aziz Ansari, and Glenn Beck have been so successful online. We've all heard the digital dimes versus linear dollars argument, which says online video still can't be monetized like legacy programming. A moment ago, actually before I came on the stage, I had a call from a reporter seeking an opinion on why Time Inc. will be laying off six or 700 people today, this week. And my answer, and I see a few folks in the audience who hopefully won't take this the wrong way, was basically, is that a blonde joke? No, I'm kidding. I'm looking right at somebody who's a very pretty blonde here, so I apologize. It wasn't directed at you. Um, I mean, it could be, but it wasn't. Um, but, but the truth is, I, I found that to be such an odd question coming from a reporter who works for a venerable uh, newspaper that we all read just about every day. I said, why don't you ask yourself the same question as opposed to asking a third party? But that's fodder for another conversation. Part of what I said a moment ago may be true, but viewers aren't demanding the breadth of options that are being delivered. They want to pay again for what they want, not what they get. The digital players who have had this realization are earning real digital dollars. The second major bottleneck is discovery. There's a haystack of content out there, for sure, but it's not so easy to find the needle. Who among us hasn't sat in front of Netflix with no idea what to watch? The days of the TV guide as we knew it are over. Whether it's Samsung's new interface or YouTube's new subscription model, the future is searchable, sortable, and social. We've seen myriad attempts at solving this problem, some more fruitful than others. I suspect in the next year we will see not one, but many new platforms for content discovery. Which brings us to the good news about the new game. There is endless opportunity and infinite room for innovation. The first thing to remember is today, everyone's a content creator and everyone's a brand. You know who has the most Facebook fans in the world? Well, all right, it's Facebook itself. But you know who has the second most? It's YouTube, supposedly Facebook's arch nemesis. And what's even more interesting is when you go down the list, you'll find brands like Coca-Cola, athletes like Cristiano Ronaldo, most of all, we find many of the same content creators we know and love. The Simpsons, Walt Disney, Family Park, South Park, and yes, even Justin Bieber. Forget programming, Rihanna can share a video on Facebook and nearly 100 million people might see it. What that all tells me is that great content still resonates and great content still succeeds. Sure, some line, online video will be free, but the latest research shows that for quality offerings stripped of advertising, viewers are more than, viewers are more than willing to pay. Just look at the HBO, HBO example, literally, as I said, called Take My Money. Innovation means traditional companies reinventing their offerings, partnering with new players, and new players emerging on old channels. TV everywhere is anywhere now. That means more opportunity, more points of distribution, more platforms, platforms to find the right viewership. So the game keeps changing, but the object remains the same, to win. Every time you take the field, peril and profit awaits in equal measure. Those who win anticipate change and take advantage of it. They transform and they are transformed. And those who don't, I guess they get to stay home and play the settlers of Catan. Thank you very much.